Thank you uh, very much, Elisa, and it's really an honor to, um, to be here and to be part of this panel this morning and to be part of this event um, that we have put together here. I'm trying to find where the cursor is. Here. Uh, you need a, an assist? No, I got it. So um, it's a challenge. I've got 15 minutes to provide historical context on the, the growth of the attack on uh, the public sector labor movement, which has been a long-running story, as we all know. Um, so how to do that? So what I'm going to do very quickly is talk about one man, one man that may, may or may not be known to folks here, but I suspect is not that well-known, and his ideas. One seminal event some people here might remember or might not, and the toxic legacy of that event. Before I get into that, though, since Elisa brought it up and it's been very much uh, on our minds, let's, let's remind ourselves about Scott Walker. Now, uh, painful as that is. Now, I'm sure many of you know um, about the story behind this particular picture. Uh, a documentary crew was uh, trailing Scott Walker uh, right after he was uh, becoming governor of the state of Wisconsin on January 18, 2011, when he met with one of his billionaire donors, Diane Hendricks. Uh, and the documentary crew did, you know, covered a very important exchange between these two. <coughs> Hendricks asked the governor when he was going to move to make Wisconsin uh, a right-to-work state. And he tried to counsel patience for her. He said, the first thing we have to do is take on the public sector. Once we do that, we can turn to the question of uh, right to work. And as we all know, that's exactly what happened. Um, after winning re-election last November and denying during the course of that re-election that he was going to try to do this, Scott Walker just recently signed a bill making Wisconsin a right to work state. Remember that the connection between the attack on the public sector and the attack on all of organized labor represented by right to work is really represented in this picture. And partly what I want to do here is to go over the, um, the, the history that leads to this moment. You might say that this moment in Wisconsin was about 40 years in the making. About 40 years ago, the public sector movement in this country was reaching a, a moment of real breakthrough. Um, after the passage of uh, legislation in Wisconsin in 1959, uh, allowing for the um, collective bargaining there, the movement spread across the country broadly in the 60s. It was renewing organized labor and it was really having an impact within the Democratic Party. It was an ascendant force. It was a force that was bringing um, women and African Americans into the labor movement as well, more than any other force had done. Uh, in the 20th century. It was a transformative force coming out of the 60s. And it was exactly at that moment, about 40, 41 years ago, that the attack on the public sector really began to take hold. I should say about the, this attack that when the public sector labor movement began to rise over the course of the uh, 1960s say it caught the right to work movement and the anti-labor movement somewhat by surprise. They had been focused on the private sector and in trying to enact right to work laws. But that movement had started to stall out in the 1960s. By the end of the 60s, the effort to broaden right to work around the country uh, was starting to stall. One of the people who was very involved in that right to work movement and this person whose ideas I want to discuss for a moment here was named Sylvester Petro. Came from an unusual background. He'd been a steel worker as a young man in Chicago, studied law, worked his way through um, Chicago Law School actually, but after graduating from law school started to move in a, a distinctly conservative direction with a distinctly libertarian uh, bent. By the mid-1950s, he'd become maybe one of the leading ideologues of the right to work movement. He wrote a book in 1957 called The Labor Policy of a Free Society, which was a thoroughgoing critique of the Wagner Act, of the NLRB, and from a libertarian point of view, that the collective bargaining regime that arose 
uh, in the, the private sector threatened the individual rights of workers. Uh, and he wanted right to work as a way of defending quote unquote individual rights. Well, Petro started to become concerned by the end of the 60s that his movement wasn't spreading. And it was at that time that he was also witnessing the spread of the public sector movement. And so by, by 1970 or so, he really switched his focus. He began to hone in on the threat that he saw represented by the public sector movement uh, and to develop a critique against that threat. Uh, I think that critique really had two prongs. One prong was legal. Uh, and Craig Becker is going to discuss some of that in a few minutes. And that prong asserted that the law in the public sector, wherever agency shop or fair share fees had been won, must be unconstitutional because if workers were paying for collective bargaining, they were paying for what had to be an inherently political act because any time a union bargains collectively, it's involved in a political act, he argued and that being forced to pay for that is an infringement on one's uh, First Amendment rights. Part of his views then were legal. I'll let Craig speak to some of that in a minute. Those views are still very alive and they're actually embraced now by one of our Supreme Court justices and possibly even a majority uh, over the next few months. The other part I wanna focus on is an ideological idea he had. And that was that the spread of public sector collective bargaining represented a power grab, a power grab by a special interest that was taking over government and that threatened to undermine democracy itself. It was that idea, that ideological idea, that he helped to frame uh, and that idea in many ways has provided the foundation for the attacks on labor in the public square that we see today. How did that idea advance? That's where I want to talk about an event. The event I want to talk about, you know, eerily enough, occurred in Baltimore uh, 41 years ago. In the summer of 1974, and some people here might remember that, uh, it involved Lee Saunders Union, AFSCME. And AFSCME at that time represented not only sanitation workers in Baltimore, but also the Baltimore police. In the summer of 1974, uh, a strike took place of sanitation workers in Baltimore. It was a wildcat strike initially. The workers rejected a contract that had been negotiated for them, which gave them a 6% raise. Now you might say 6% raise, wow, and that wasn't enough? But inflation that year was 11%. So the workers knew that they'd be ratifying a pay cut for themselves, and they decided not to accept it. Garbage began to pile up in the city. Around the same time, cops were also uh, protesting in Baltimore. And in fact, uh, they engaged in a number of job actions that summer, first by writing nuisance tickets, uh, including to the mayor's limousine, the mayor then was William Donald Schaefer, future governor of Maryland. Uh, and ultimately, some police even walked out uh, before this was done. Jerry Wirth was then in Lee's seat, so to speak. He was president of AFSCME. And Wirth became deeply involved in the, in the conflict that was going on in Baltimore that summer. And he eventually began uh, and, and was successful in bringing it to a conclusion. Uh, negotiating basically with the mayor and the then Democratic governor of Maryland, Marvin Mandel. Uh, the outcome of the negotiation was typical of many labor negotiations. Nobody was really fully satisfied with it, uh, but uh, it kind of worked for all sides, right? It was a real compromise. But an important part of that compromise was that behind closed doors, Mandel had promised that there would be no retribution against the police for having participated in a job action. Once everybody went back to work, the city began to take retribution against the police uh, under Mayor Schaefer, uh, reassigning some leaders uh, of the police part of the job action, trying to fire others, Wirth and other labor leaders were furious and they uh, believed that they had been betrayed 
uh, and they decided uh, that um, they would call out Mandel. He had promised not to let this happen. Uh, they did call him out. Uh, and at that point, Mandel made an important decision. He decided that uh, he would uh, take the attack against Werf. Uh, he argued that Werf was being irresponsible. And he made a very charged threat or, or, or charge at that time. He said that what Werf had done during the negotiations is he had threatened to let Baltimore burn if the union didn't get what it wanted. This was a Democratic governor saying this about the union leader. Mandel assailed Werf. Mandel was weren't running for re-election that year. And actually, that was a politically calculated decision. And as the Baltimore Sun had it, it served Mandel well. It allowed him to portray himself as standing up to this union bully uh, by making this charge. And by the way, the charge was never substantiated. It was a lie. Uh, but it helped Mandel to sort of gain credibility with the quote unquote middle. It happened at a crucial moment uh, in the formation of the, the movement against the uh, public sector anti-unionism. Just months before, an organization called the Public Service Research Council had been founded, inspired by Petro's ideas. But that organization was not finding a good way to get across Petro's ideological attack uh, against public sector unions at this moment. What they needed was a narrative that would push this ideological notion forward. And what happened in Baltimore gave them that narrative. The organization recruited a conservative writer, Ralph de Toledano, who rushed out with a book, and it was called Let Our Cities Burn. The book argued that Werf had threatened to burn down Baltimore, and that public sector unions in general were prepared to let our cities burn unless the union bosses got what they wanted. Uh, it was all a lie, but it really bit hard into the public consciousness. Here's to Toledano giving his book to Jesse Helms. Jesse Helms, <laughs> Helms wrote the preface for the book. But it's important for us to remember that this lie was first enunciated by Democrats, right? It was a bipartisan lie. It was one that Jesse Helms promoted and Marvin Mandel promoted. And had it not been, it wouldn't have taken off the way it did. In many ways, you could say that what we've seen over the past 40 years is the perpetuation of that lie in different forms. That what organized labor has wanted to do is to put its own selfish interests first, ahead of the public interest. That teachers unions are prepared to sacrifice the future of poor kids to protect the selfish interests of teachers. That public pensions are underfunded because they were too generous to begin with. Uh, because they had, uh, unions were so greedy in, in negotiating them, rather than uh, that, that politicians for generations did nothing to properly fund them. The idea persists, but the idea wouldn't have persisted the way it did had it not been a bipartisan idea. In the 70s, other mayors did the same kind of thing. Mayors like Alioto, Jackson, uh, Koch. And down to the present day, you might say that, you know, some Democratic uh, <laughs> leaders of today perpetuate this kind of let our cities burn lie in different ways as well. And maybe more subtle ways, but at the heart of it, that's what they're arguing. That labor is prepared to let the city burn in order to get its way. It's, it's a lie, uh, and it must be exposed. But it is a lie at the heart of what's wrong right now. Um, just to conclude one quick um, thing. I, I, what do we learn from this? Three things, I think. One is that in order to turn the page, we have to confront that lie head on. Uh, there is no uh, resurrecting of our movement unless we debunk that lie. Second, that to debunk that lie, we have to do things differently not just reframe our arguments, as somebody like George Lakoff might do, but do things differently that counter the lie, that make labor and the community so visibly publicly allied that the lie can't stand in the light of that. 
Some unions are doing that now through uh, things like the bargaining for the common good movement we can talk about later. Uh, and just finally, I would say that what this history helps us understand is that organized, uh, that, the f that so much hangs in the balance. Going back to the, to the first thing, what Scott Walker understood is that breaking the power of public labor was necessary to attack all of organized labor. And we might turn that around and say we have to defend public sector labor if we're going to have a labor movement in the future, so thank you. I don't know if you still want that.